welcome everyone to today's launch of the Regional Center of Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development. My name is Iveta Silova, and I'm Professor and Associate Dean of Global Engagement at Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College and also Senior Global Futures Scholar. Please join me in welcoming Miss Indigenous ASU first attendant, Aidan Cladis. Aidan Cladis has generously agreed to open today's gathering with the land acknowledgement, and we thank Aidan for the support through the ASU Office of uh, Special Advisor to the President on American Indian Affairs. Thank you so much. So, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Aidan Cladis. To get started off today, I'll be reading the land acknowledgement, but before that, I'd like to introduce you to myself. Um, to do so, I will be saying it in my um, language. I am Dine or Navajo. So that's, um, I'll get started, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's a Torich Eatney Nishle. Do the Nesh Bahe Bashish Chin. Ma Idesh Gizni Dasha Che, do the Nesh Bahe Dashanale. Aiden Clydes Yenesha. The H. Eho Toy, Dan Nasha, Kadeho Do the Shavan. Arizona State University, the Inchta, Justice Studies, though American Indian Studies, Ba Inchta. Yeah. So. To translate, um, hello everyone, welcome. Um, I am born for the Bitterwater Clan and also I'm African-American. Um, I come from a community in the Navajo reservation called St. Michael's um, or Chihotsoa, that's what we used to call it. Um, I currently live here in the Valley in Mesa um, and I'm attending ASU with a um, major in justice studies and a minor in American Indian studies. I plan to attend law school. Um, that's my future goal to become an indigenous um, Indian legal attorney um, and work in environmental issues, um, law, land, or land and water rights kind of thing. So that's, that's me, the quick introduction. So now the land acknowledgement, thank you. <clears throat> Arizona State University's campuses are situated on the homelands of many tribal nations, in particular, the Atham and Pequosh, and acknowledge the many indigenous communities who reside in this territory. Kikik is the Atham word that is known as Phoenix. Which, is settled, which was settled in 1881 by occupiers. The ancestors of the Otham, the Hukum, created canals and utilized surrounding rivers as the basis of today's, the current irrigation system that feeds Kikik today. These waterways have always been the foundation of, the, of livelihood and the residents that live in the valley. Throughout the past 500 years, the impact of colonialism has been detrimental to indigenous lands and languages affecting their livelihood. Many people who live in the Southwest are unaware of our histories. Furthermore, ASU's indigenous student community consists of over 3,000 strong, not including faculty, staff, and alumni who have come and continue to thrive, educate, and advocate for the strengthening of indigenous ways of life. As the Otham call it, Himdog, the way of life for the Otham, encompassing their culture, language, identity, and being. As Otham and all indigenous peoples, our, identi our identity is tied with the land. Like our own bodies, we must respect and care for it. We urge each of you and everyone to do the same. We challenge you to educate yourself about the history and the communities who continue to thrive today. Moving forward, it is vital to honor and respect that you are always on indigenous land. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aiden, for this beautiful introduction and land acknowledgement. The establishment of the RC Greater Phoenix was a community-wide effort. And we are happy to have an opportunity today to hear from many people and institutions that were critical in the process of making this possible. It is now my honor to welcome Peter Schlosser, the Vice President and Vice Provost of Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory at Arizona State University for welcoming remarks. Thank you, Iveta, and uh, also thank you, Katya. And all the teams who worked with you to create that center for regional expertise with the special emphasis on education for sustainable development in the greater Phoenix area. This uh, effort has been led by many people and, in, and, and uh, entities here at ASU, and it helped bring together more closely, for example, Global Futures Laboratory, the Mary Lou uh, Fulton, a teacher's college, and many others around the area of 
providing an education that will allow us to get the expertise that's needed to move into the future in a way that we preserve opportunities rather than being constrained more and more by the pressures that we have put upon our planet. So on that, a little bit about uh, Global Futures Laboratory. Most of you know that, but uh, just in case, and I will we'll keep that short. Um, of course, uh, the, the Global Futures Laboratory, full name, Julie and Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory, was created to provide a platform for all kinds of issues that relate to the future of our planet. So all the transformations that are needed of complex systems using innovation that we have here so that we can create a future in which all life, actually not just human life, all life can thrive on a planet that's still healthy. And why is that important? We are seeing daily, actually, definitely weekly, if you look around, the effects of human activity on the life supporting system of our planet. We see more extremes like climate, but also from other pressures um, that express themselves in more forms, more places at higher amplitudes and higher frequencies. So we are moving from extreme events to crises with the potential to end in a planetary catastrophe. And we have to do everything in our power to prevent that. In order to do that, we have to actually look at the world today and tomorrow in a holistic fashion. We do have to understand individual pieces of it, such as climate, food security, societal stability, things like that. But we also have to understand the, the overall context in which these things are moving. In order to do that, we actually have to bring together expertise from many backgrounds, from the teacher's college, natural sciences, humanities, social sciences, medical sciences, engineering. And that is really what we are trying to do to create a platform where people can easily move into the mode of transdisciplinarity. So, but in spite of all these issues that we are facing, there is a hopeful element to it. We have actually in principle, a lot of the solution to the problem that we are facing. What is often lacking, which I think is the, the most fundamental issue that in GFL, but also across the university, across academia as a whole, we have to address is understanding decision-making by individuals to global society. What drives it? What are the value systems that are underlying it? How persistent are they? And how can we actually incentivize people to make different choices than the ones that got us into that pressure situation? And that brings me back then to the education side, because that actually means that we, education is a key part of that. And it's not just educating students who are coming to universities, to colleges, to get a degree. It is really lifelong learning. We have entered part of an era where we not enough to go through elementary school, high school, college, and then you are done you know what you need for life. That actually was the way, when I grew up, that was still a little bit the way to think, right? You learn and then you had a profession and you profess that throughout your career. That's not the world we live in. We have to actually make sure that the way we design these education initiatives, that they keep on going when we leave an institution such as uh, ASU. And so that needs partnerships cannot do that out of one um, school or one college or one center. And that is what I think is so great about this new initiative, this regional center of uh, expertise. It will empower all learners beyond the ones who are joining us here at, at ASU. And it will actually also have impact on communities, also on the youth movement. So it is a, a great platform from which to address critical issues, but do it in a way that's inclusive, that's reaching out, not just inward looking, outward looking, and looks at longer times. So it is in a way a cross-sector initiative designed to connect resources, knowledge of the new center, teachers college, probably futures lab, 
many other entities, ASU as a whole, and the whole learning community across the, the globe. So I'm looking forward to seeing the impact of this new center and the way it will actually change how we look at ASU within TFL, other entities, at education, at engagement, through education, and uh, we'll really look, I'm really looking forward to see how this impact will play out and will help make this world a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. The synergies between Global Futures Lab and education are absolutely amazing. And I am thrilled to welcome the Dean of Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College, Carol Basile. So in, uh, let me think what year it was, 1990, 91, 92, I was working for an oil company who shall remain nameless. And at the same time I was working for that oil company, I was also, my avocation, I'm a birder at heart, and I was working with kids in nature centers and volunteering on weekends and doing all kinds of things, right, in, in environmental ed and sustainability and I was in Houston at the time we were working, I was working with the Galveston Bay Foundation, all kinds of things like that. And I woke up one day and said, you know, what I really wanna do is I wanna to continue to work with adults and doing, I was doing training and organizational development work, but I really think, you know, we, we need to do this with kids. And how could I bring those two things together? And that took me back um, to the university, to, you know, and the rest is history, as they say. But, when I started that doctorate, I had a professor at the time who said he was working with middle school and high school kids and, you know, and work around science and society and technology and all of that work that, that was going on at the time. And he said, you know, we're doing this at this level and you want to do this with young kids and that's impossible. You, you can't do this with young kids. And so, you know, sure enough, if you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to do it. And so we set out um, with colleagues over a number of years to prove that we really needed to do this with even our youngest children. We needed to figure out how not only we could make them aware of all of the things that were going on, how to get them to notice, how to get them to be observant, how to get them to really think about what was happening, to try to think about the misconceptions that were happening and how do we, how do we start to break those early, but also then how to drive them to action into citizenship. And so what was it that even the, our youngest of our population could do as they were thinking about the environment and sustainability and all the things that were ahead of them? And so here we are today um, thinking about this, you know, a, a ASU's Global Futures Laboratory, which reflects the wider mission of ASU in creating a platform for ongoing and wide ranging exchange across all knowledge domains. And it's an unbelievable endeavor. And my hat's off to Peter, who's, who's leading this, because it is, it is truly, uh, it is emergent, but it is unbelievably urgent. And so at the same time, AS, as ASU is doing this, the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College recognizes that education is the important catalyst to all of this, because the scientists can do all do this work. And if we don't think about how we're going to educate and how we're going to translate this to a lay audience and how we're going to make sense of this for people, then we're not going to get as far as we would like to go. And so we believe that education is central to this, that is to solving sustainability and environmental challenges while ensuring a habitable planet and the future well-being that is attainable for all human and non-human kind. So as ASU has been leading the transformation of, of higher education, education in schools and out of schools has to be a priority and we need to figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to build it. And this RCE gives us one component of that as we start to bring people together around the SDGs in our local context through participatory process. Simultaneously, we also need to build a broader initiative, right? To build the academic programs, the certificates, the nano courses, the stackable, whatever we're talking about today, um, as well as advanced uh, interdisciplinary research agenda to redefine the role of education in shaping sustainable planetary futures. So this is our opportunity to bring people in perspective together to understand how to translate complex content, to think about educators and with the support and input of scientists and others that we can transform curriculum and pedagogies and governance structures and processes right of our schools and our school systems to really emphasize this interdependence and collaboration of all stakeholders. 
And so this launch, right, is, is tremendous. It is being driven by what we call principled innovation. So Peter talked about the decisions that we all have to make. Principled innovation started in our college as a way to start thinking about the dispositions that people have, the moral, the uh, civic, the intellectual, the performance assets that people need in order to really make decisions. That principled innovation will now be the, the ninth design aspiration of ASU. And so everything we do becomes driven by we can, but should we? And so all of these decisions, all of the things that we're thinking about in education, then we start to, we start to look through those lenses to make sure that we're making the right decisions for, for all of us. So I wanna thank our partners in this, uh, Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory, ASU's Knowledge Exchange for Resilience has been part of this um, and have been actively involved in establishing this. And also want to thank Underwriters Laboratory, really somewhere out here, um, are really our first philanthropic partner um, that has really shown confidence in, in, our, in our design and a path forward. So thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you so much, Carol. And now I would like to introduce the director of the RCE Greater Phoenix, Katja Brundius. Katja also serves as a clinical associate professor at the School of Sustainability College of Global Futures. In her research and teaching, she explores the intersection between sustainability and disasters to support disaster preparedness and recovery towards equitable and sustainable and resilient futures. Katya is also involved in a variety of sustainability education initiatives uh, at various levels. In our local community, she is part of the community city university collaboration with cool kids, cool futures and cool places. At the national level, she's involved in exploring pathways to accreditation for sustainability programs with the Global Council for Science and the Environment. And internationally, Katja collaborates with UNESCO and the UN Institute for Training and Research on the SDG Learn platform. So please join me in welcoming Katja Brundius. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much, Veta, for these very generous words. Um, and it's now on me um, to introduce you to the um, Regional Center of Expertise for Education for Sustainable Development and what that is and what we hope to achieve with everyone here together. And just bear with me for a moment as I... Um... So, um, start with, anyway, what I wanted to say is the Regional Center for Expertise of uh, Greater Phoenix for Education for Sustainable Development, which we appreciate as the RCE Greater Phoenix Order, a long phrase, has been now one of um, the, the members of an international network and we join already 180 of those centers around the world and this is a wonderful opportunity because these regional centers of expertise were founded by the unesco as a way to keep the role of education and peter schlosser said this so nicely it's education is hope to keep this first and foremost on our radar specifically for policy making and on january 24th two days ago we celebrated the international day of education with the slogan, prioritize, invest in people, prioritize education. And to keep education first and foremost, specifically for sustainable futures, UNESCO decided that after the end of the UNESCO decade for education for sustainable development, which was from 2004 to 2015, we need to continue that momentum. And they thought it's best to continue a global campaign through local actions, and that's why they said, why don't we create these regional centers of expertise that bring together everyone committed to education? And um, in this regard, every regional center of expertise really tries to build on the whole of community, bringing in partners from K through 12, from higher education, but then also from the business sector, from our municipalities, our governments, from local to state, and our um, nonprofit organizations, as well as civil society organizations and grassroots. And we are so thankful and happy and hopeful 
that we could get partners from all of these sectors of society to join into the creation of this regional center of expertise. And those who stay with us throughout the day, you will get to hear from many of those. We have them already here in the audience. There will be a wonderful panel where you hear from our partners for future from 1.30 to 2.30 back here. Um, and so you will get exposed to what they do in the area of education for sustainable development. And for us, it was really a wonderful opportunity to develop this regional center of expertise because we realized, and again, Peter, and Dean Basilio were mentioning this, we live in a time of ongoing crisis. And we saw that here in the Valley, so many organizations, individuals were committed to addressing that crisis by building up our capacity and exchanging what we can in the field of sustainability education. And so we wanted to respond to this need by saying, why don't we bring people together and use this opportunity to found the center? And then our mission really is to support and advance sustainability in the region, supporting all community members through meaningful, equitable, and participatory learning processes, while we prioritize access to education specifically for underrepresented communities and specifically for our young voices who help us build the futures that they are going to inhabit. With regards to the goals that um, in the, the process of establishing DRC, we agreed a on a couple of goals. And um, we hope we, have, we can achieve those goals both on the individual level and a collective level. On the individual level, we hope that everyone who gets involved with this collective effort will um, feel positively empowered and positively touched and really commit to this collective effort towards achieving um, four sustainable development goals that we identified as a key priority because we cannot do everything. So we wanted to focus our resources and energy. The first one obviously is education, quality education. One of our partners, the city of Tempe um, is working here very hard and we had an opportunity to learn from them how they have been learning themselves in collaborating with our um, tribal communities in thinking about what does decolonizing education really means and how can we build in learning from indigenous wisdom in our effort to enhance quality education. Then the second goal is on reducing inequalities and fostering gender equity within our communities and also across our communities. And here again, I like to remember the slogan of the day of education, which is investing in people, prioritizing education with a focus on gender equity. The third goal then is focused on sustainable cities and community, where we are reminded to work together to make our cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable and keeping at the fore of our mind, our commitment, what we heard in the land acknowledgement um, and on healing around um, the colonial history. And again, we will hear from our panelists about how we understand the connection between cities and the rural communities, the rural environments, and how we can come closer together across that um, sometimes divide as well. And lastly, there's the goal of climate action to take the urgent action that's needed to combat the climate emergency and all its impacts. And again, we will hear from panelists later today from our um, youth movement, what they are doing and the actions they invite us to join to address that and work towards um, a sustainable vision. So to maybe also explain the logo that you see here, we started out with thinking about these four sustainable development goals, education, reducing inequities, climate action, and making our um, settlements and cities sustainable. And this is represented through the colors. And then I mentioned that we have partners from all sectors of society, and you see the sectors, you know, um, kind of slices of a pie, and they all focus around um, this shared commitment. To, to sustainability education and 
specifically to create pathways that improve access to sustainability education. And not just in formal sectors like in schools, et cetera, but we have so many opportunities to do lifelong learning in various um, pockets of our communities. And we want to bring those, those to life and to the fore and connect them with each other. And that's our second commitment. We really want to foster synergies among all of us. And that often starts with getting to know each other and building the relationships, taking the time that relationship building needs so that we know who is offering what in this very rich landscape and how we can make this accessible. The third um, area where we would like to have an impact is to increase our learning from each other. We often work in our own silos, in our sectors, and we don't appreciate the learning that's going on in other places. And so I invite all of you to help us think about how we can make that efficient so that it's not another thing on your daily um, task list that you need to accomplish. And obviously with um, the RC Greater Phoenix being housed at a research university, which we really understand as a boundary object. It sits at the boundary between the university and between the community. And we want to be equal partners in spanning that boundary. And in doing so, we want to provide what research universities can provide. And this is a research-driven approach to what we do so that we can draw on available information, available knowledge, and also um, evaluate and explore whether we are doing what we want to do and whether we, do, we are doing it in the ways we committed to do so. And I'm just quickly advancing to our partners. You see here, this is the spectrum of partners that committed um, to creating the regional center of expertise for education for sustainable development. We are not limited to these partners, but these are our foundational relationships. And I also wanted to quickly introduce who you can approach here at ASU. If you see these faces, please come and connect with us so that we can start collaborating and um, working on those various efforts. And with this, I hand it over to Alejandra, who, Alejandra Enrique Gates, who is the program manager for the RCE Greater Phoenix. And Alejandra will take us to the next part of our introductions. Thank you, Kathia. Thank you so much for this. We are very fortunate to have received the message from Dr. Jume Yamaguchi, Director for the Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability from United Nations University. Please listen. Hello, everyone. Distinguished members of RC Greater Phoenix and honorable participants. On behalf of the United Nations University Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability, I would like to express our congratulations to the new RCE Greater Phoenix on the occasion of its official launching ceremony. The Regional Centers of Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development is a unique and powerful mechanism to translate the global goals toward sustainable development into local action. Since the inception of its initiative in 2005, as of today, over 180 RCEs were acknowledged across the world. The Global RC community is delighted to welcome RC Greater Phoenix, and we believe that it will play a crucial role in transforming the region toward a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable the future. I'd like to express our sincere appreciation to all the stakeholders from different sectors from their concerted effort to streamline your active collaboration to realize the vision and goals of RCE Greater Phoenix. Last year, United Nations University Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability contributed to multiple critical international conferences. We took an opportunity to present RCE's initiatives and practices and introduced this unique network. For example, at the Transforming Education Summit convened by the UN Secretary General last September, we presented the RCE as a promising approach for transformative ESD. 
the core the message was quote communities and youth implement a whole society approach to climate change education and long life learning unquote the session attracted great attention among a diverse audience from different sectors, including universities, government, NGOs, and UN agencies. At COP27 in Shark as Sheikh Egypt last November, UNOIAS organized events illustrating RC's project to address climate change and discuss the transformative community-based climate action. I believe RCEs have a huge potential to empower the people through the synergistic action at the local level to advance the transformation of the societies. In closing, let me express again my sincere congratulations to RCE Greater Phoenix and my appreciation to their leadership on this momentum occasion. Our institute is committed to further facilitating the Global RC Network, expanding our outreach and raising visibility the worldwide. We are looking forward to working with RC Greater Phoenix in the month and the years ahead. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. We also received a message from one of our RCE Global Networks, RCE Dublin, which is hosted at Dublin City University, one of Arizona State University's partners. Good day to all. I am Professor Charlotte Holland, Director of RCE Dublin, which is coordinated by Dublin City University. RCE Dublin was acknowledged by the UN University uh, as a centre of expertise in educating for sustainability back in 2014. And since then, we have rolled out many education projects and programmes with learners and civil society within the theme of sustainable development. It gives me great pleasure today to welcome RCE Greater Phoenix to the global RCE network. Sustainability education and related activities are critical to empowering our citizens to become agents of change uh, in moving towards more sustainable, just and equitable ways of living and being. The sustainable development goals articulated within Agenda 2030 and the Education 2030 roadmap clearly require us to accelerate actions for sustainable development. RCE Greater Phoenix is going to do just this. It will directly contribute uh, to the goals of uh, Agenda 2030 by fostering cross-sectoral collaborations that empower learners, especially marginalized youth, uh, to access high quality, sustainability education, both formal and informal, and engage in meaningful learning experiences that contribute to sustainability outcomes for the whole Arizona region. Colleagues here in Dublin City University are already working closely with colleagues in Arizona State University, which coordinates, obviously, Greater Phoenix, uh, RCE Greater Phoenix. Some of these joint projects aim to, to contribute to Sustainable Development Goal 4, which is a focus on quality education, particularly reorienting education systems to address sustainability. ASU is already a global leader in promoting educational innovation in this regard. I have two examples here. They have this wonderful, turn it, whoops, there we go, turn it around, a flashcard card series, and they also have the principled innovation series, both incredible, valuable resources that can be used in many different ways and across different jurisdiction. So I am personally looking forward to deepening our collaborations with colleagues in RCE Greater Phoenix. Congratulations to all involved and best wishes from RCE Dublin.
And Dr. Charlotte Hohen is the director of the RCA Dublin, and she's also the Dean of the College of Education at Dublin City University. Aloha, the Lina Meki Aloha. Welcome. We want to welcome the UNU RCE Greater Phoenix to the amazing United Nations University Regional Center of Expertise, as you are definitely recognized as a model of education for sustainable development. UNU Hub U RCE Hawaii, Moana Nui Kea, was so excited to join today on this International Day of Education that we want to welcome you to the global ohana, the family of people working together for the right to a clean, healthy, sustainable environment, but also making sure that everyone knows what their rights are and are learning about the most important updated document that expands on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We know you are dedicated to a certain set of those 17 global goals, but also recognize the intersectionality of those goals and are implementing them on the ground in Greater Phoenix. It was great to meet you on my way here to the United Nations Human Rights Council Working Group on the Universal Periodic Review, and to be able to get you know better and to see how many of the activities that we're involved in and our core passions and principles overlap so that we can see what is possible. We know we began talking first and foremost about the way that we both are involved at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Conference of Parties, known as the COP, and that we've both been to many of them. We look forward to exploring how we can bring our students so that they can learn the diplomacy, but more importantly, have that direct hands-on experience to be future diplomats to make sure that the principles noted in the Paris Agreement are able to be realized so that we can protect our island Earth and make sure that we all have a planet to live on. We also were excited to share the things that we have in common, focusing around human rights. And as we're here at the Universal Periodic Review, what's so exciting is I was at a side event today looking at climate change and human rights and raising recommendations. They also mentioned what's exciting at the UPR is they take all of the recommendations provided and then make sure that they link with one of the UN 17 global goals. So there's so much we look forward to doing together. I'm so excited to be part of this process with you on education for sustainable development. Malohi and Mekapono, peace with justice, and welcome to our Ohana and look forward to coordinating together. Now we received a message from one of our local partners, one of our founding partners that is uh, from the city of Tempe, Dr. Braden Kay. Sustainability and Resilience Director of the City of Tempe. Hi, I'm Braden Kay. I am the Sustainability and Resilience Director for the City of Tempe. Uh, and I'm a proud graduate of Arizona State School of Sustainability. Um, I, and I am a former educator, a middle school educator, uh, taught uh, Teach for America St. Louis, uh, and also in Gary, Indiana for a year. And so I come to this work and I come to this meeting uh, as someone very passionate about sustainability education and the power of empowering young people to become world-class problem solvers uh, and, and to meet the, the crises that we currently are experiencing and that will only get worse over the coming decades. Um, so it is so exciting to be able to celebrate the creation of this regional center for expertise for education for sustainable development. This is an opportunity to celebrate all the great work that's happened here, as well as to find ways to connect and work on building uh, an even greater suppository of knowledge and practices uh, uh, around sustainability education. One of the things that's so exciting and that we have to absolutely celebrate are the assets that we have in terms of building a great powerhouse of sustainability education uh, in Arizona State University and all of its leadership, but also in the incredible work that I've seen over the last 15 years from school districts in innovating new types of sustainability curriculum, starting the sustainability focused schools, um, celebrating uh, uh, sustainability leaders within students, uh, as well as in teachers. Uh, it's also great to have the support of the uh, Teachers Academy at ASU and other support services that are helping teachers and classrooms across the valley uh, do sustainability education. There's also a huge opportunity to grow the tent. So uh, I know one of the speakers there uh, this week is Carlos Casanova. He's a uh, ed education professor at ASU that we've had the opportunity of working with. To 
he traditionally was a social justice educator. Uh, he came here on, on a postdoc and now is a, a, a tenure pack track professor. Uh, and we brought in him into the fold of sustainability education uh, where he didn't start out his career. So it's a perfect example. Carlos is an incredible example of how we can expand how we think about sustainability education and we can bring in experts and uh, folks with incredible education experience that can be supportive of sustainability education in our region. Another incredible asset we have is all the work that has been done and uh, we're hugely grateful to so many ASU professors, uh, one of them being Katja Brunders, who's worked so hard on teaching professional skills for sustainability and a group of professors uh, that have worked on sustainability competencies. Uh, it's really important, far too often, folks see sustainability as content areas and not as skill sets and competencies that we need to grow and work on. Uh, future thinking and thinking about the, uh, how, how to work with scenarios, how to create long-term visions, how to create goals, uh, strategic thinking, how to create action plans, how to create long-term transitions and movement building, collaboration, how we work together on teams when we're doing these types of joint problem solving activities. Uh, we're still too focused as educators and as sustainability professionals on problem analysis and current state analysis and the history and economics of a problem and not driving ourselves towards really developing new ways of uh, solving problems, creating long-term uh, transition plans. Uh, we need to push ourselves uh, to get out of the past ways of solving problems and focusing overly on problem analysis and embracing sustainability competencies and a forward thinking trajectory on how we teach people to solve problems. Um, so quickly, I just wanna show you a few things that we've been up to uh, in Tempe. We have a youth agenda, we have a climate justice agenda. We've been figuring out how to collaborate. Our neighborhoods agenda was co-created with ASU students. Our climate justice agenda was co-created with a local nonprofit. Our business agenda was co-created with uh, Local First Arizona and our Tempe Chamber of Commerce. And our youth agenda was created with middle and high school students in our city. Uh, so there is a huge opportunity as we do sustainability work to make sure that uh, we're doing that work with residents that are most marginalized and with voices that matter, like our young people. And it's been so inspiring to have recent work funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Cool Kids, Cool Places, Cool Futures, which is a city university community collaboration project. And we've been learning a lot about how to work with young people on climate action. We've also been learning a lot on how to center uh, indigenous voices and indigenous knowledge in climate action. We've been partnering with the Indigenous Design Collaborative and Juan de la Costa and Selena Martinez, who've been really helping us think about how to incorporate indigenous creatives and indigenous knowledge into climate action work. Uh, and there's also an amazing resource at ASU in the Labriola uh, to, with, with a group of indigenous librarians who are thinking about indigenous knowledge and how to make indigenous knowledge uh, more available uh, to the state. So there is a massive need to decolonize our curriculum, to focus more on indigenous knowledge. I will say when I came here uh, 15 years ago, there wasn't as much a focus on indigenous knowledge and indigenous voices. And there was an overemphasis on Western knowledge and, and Western approaches to sustainability problem solving. And that really needs to change. And there's a huge opportunity in Arizona to do that. Uh, by centering BIPOC voices, by centering climate justice, by centering indigenous voices. So today is a time to celebrate how far we've come in thinking about sustainability and sustainability education as a region. Uh, it's also a time to connect with each other and make sure we're supporting the next generation of students, the next generation of sustainability professionals, and pushing ourselves uh, to do better. So thanks so much for all the work you're doing. Look forward to collaborating in the future. Um, and uh, deeply appreciate uh, the, the work that we'll all be doing together to create uh, a truly excellent regional approach to sustainability education. So that you get to see the whole roundup of who is part of the core team. Now it's my honor to welcome Molly Cashin to the stage. Molly Cashin is the senior program manager of the Sustainability Teachers Academy. And she will introduce our other guest of honor. Molly, over to you. Thanks, Katya. Uh, hey, y'all. Um, I'm Molly Cashin. As Katya already said, I'm the senior program manager for the 
Rob and Melanie Walton, Sustainability Teachers Academies here at the College of Global Futures at Arizona State University. I'm gonna quiz you on that later. Um, so the Teachers Academies, we have been a program that's been running for about seven years. And we focus on teacher education for in-service teachers, um, K through 12. And our mission is to bring sustainability into communities and provide resources where sustainability can be both lived and learned. Um, we've been working nationally. Our, our program is a national focus. And we have worked with over, I think, 2,500 teachers across the country in all 50 states. And we have several different models for bringing professional development to K through 12 teachers and the community. Uh, and one of those model models is through a fellowship. So who better to understand what teachers and students need than teachers and students? Um, so we like to engage and teach with teachers, administrators, and hopefully some other informal educators um, in order to bring sustainability and futures thinking to life in classrooms. Um, and, you know, as being part of the regional center of expertise and also part of a national program, uh, we would like to bring in somebody to help us really focus some of our efforts more locally, which is where our wonderful partner from UL Research Institutes comes in. Um, so I'd like to introduce Kelly Kina to talk a little bit more about some of our upcoming um, uh, opportunities. Thank you. Good morning. So I, uh, my name is Kelly Kina. I'm the Director of Research Experiences and Education for UL Research Institutes. I'll add that to Molly's quiz later. Um, UL is the word mark that um, many people don't know until I tell them that we're in everybody's home and we're in this room and likely in your backpacks because one part of our three-pronged organization is a testing and certification business. And that business is 128 years old. So we uh, have been working to make the world a safer place since then. But the other two parts of our organization are really focused on nonprofit missions. One is a standards and engagement organization that's really focused on making the world um, safer through engineering. We engineer a safer world. This room has been designed to keep you safe, right? And then UL Research Institutes is really about the discovery that helps us engineer that. But really critical to the word safety and to this partnership is that sustainability is really core to how we define safety. We can't have safe world without a sustainable one. So um, really, when we think about the research that we're doing, it's for that mission. And I have the privilege of working across all of the research that we do for discovery um, as a, an educator and to bring young people into our organizations as potential careers. So that's who we are. That's the, the blue circle up there. Um, and, you know, regional efforts like this are really critical to our success. Our collaborative partnership is focused on participatory education with teacher and youth fellows. That's going to be hyper-focused here with the RCE and working with Molly's incredible team. And then thinking about how we can work with Stuart Miller from our Materials Discovery Research Institute and his work on water capture and carbon capture. So thinking about the next level of where discovery should be and could be um, in, in um, sustainability. And so bringing that in and then bringing your knowledge and expertise into our organization and the work that we do. So really thinking of this um, collaboration in its purest and truest form. So on behalf of UL Research Institutes, um, thank you for the work to create this RCE and thank you for all you do. And we are ready to get started on this good work together. Thanks, congratulations. Now off to another member of the RC, I invite Jordan King, a PhD student at the School of Sustainability, who will introduce us in a very creative um, part of today. Great, thank you, Katya. I have the great honor of introducing our next speaker, uh, Valencia Val Clement. Uh, Val is a Haitian American poet and writer from New York, as well as a recent doctoral graduate in educational policy and evaluation from Arizona State University. Val's research has explored topics including epistemic justice, blackness, black feminist philosophy, 
curriculum, arts-based arts methods, mixed methods research, and critical black literacies. As a result of Val's love for writing and her, her way through the times, Val has published seven poetry books and a vegan cookbook. Uh, naming all of her books, as you can see on the screen, uh, with words from Haitian Creole to honor her ancestry. Writing and publishing have created a space in Val's life to practice agency, be vulnerable, and make connections on and off the page. She hopes her work uh, and stories empower people to express their collective histories, healing alchemies and counter histories through creative expression. Through this work, Val demonstrates and embodies that creativity is a salve for these unprecedented times. We are so honored and appreciative to have Val share her words and thoughts with us in recognition of these unprecedented times and the hope inspired today by the launch of RCA Greater Phoenix. Uh, so with that, Val, welcome you to the stage. Thank you, Jordan, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Iveta, for inviting me, and thank you to everyone as part of the RCE team um, who's helping to make actions like this possible. Um, it's really important for us to consider the ways that art can help us to connect and educate communities about what's going on in the world. Um, typically, when I come to these spaces, um, my job is kind of to shake things up a little bit and to help us to kind of think about connections that are often understated um, within our communities, within our culture, society, um, and how those connect to systems that connect to sustainability. Because ultimately, as we learn more about sustainability, one of the most important things that I've taken away from it is that the most vulnerable people are affected first. And so when we think about the floods that are happening in Pakistan, the mining that is happening in the Congo, um, those are not necessarily the people who are in the Exxon boards, for example. Those are not necessarily the people that are benefiting from a lot of the things that we benefit from by being able to have cars, by being able to have electricity and running water throughout the day. Um, those are things that I'm intimately connected with because of my Haitian ancestry and being able to go back to where my family is from and see that there are no roads and see the impacts of colonial colonialization and imperialism on my family, on my grandmother who was never allowed to learn to read and write. And so today I want to kind of bring you to sustainability and climate justice in a kind of roundabout way. And I hope that you can understand um, why I'm doing this. But um, I wanted to talk to you guys about uh, September 11th and provide a trigger warning for anybody who it triggers. Um, because I'm from New York City, that's where I was born. Um, and I think that 9-11 was actually my first full understanding of what politics and um, war, um, how those things actually impact our climate really intimately. Um, and so I'm gonna start with this piece um, and just want you to think about things like atomic bombs, warm, Chernobyl, all of these different things that are part of the science that brings us a lot of us to these places and research, but also have real life implications on like our lives, the lands that we live in, the places that we walk and the places that we call home. And so this first piece is called September 11th, 2001. And during this time I was seven years old. So I was really young and didn't fully understand what was happening. But one thing that I did understand was two weeks before I'd taken a walk to the financial district in New York City, I'd seen the Empire State Building, I'd seen the Twin Towers, and two weeks later it was a gaping hole um, that was causing people disease, cancers, and things that still affect firefighters and first responders and folks who live in that area to this day. So September 11th, 2001, plus 19 years of perspective. I remember this day clearly and sincerely. It was the worst day in the worst way. Started my day praying on my knees, ended it screaming, oh Lord, please don't let this be. But despite my pleas, smoke clouds fill the city. New York City was only impervious in theory. Now buildings come crashing down and debris and smoke devour downtown. Just two weeks before, Tia and I took a subway trip to explore. I saw needles touching clouds called skyscrapers. I went to the city full of strangers and felt no danger. But on 9-11, the buildings I gawked at collapsed on replay, and I learned not everyone comes home from work every day. I was seven when kids changed their names from Mohammed and Osama. I lived in a country that doubled down on racism and dogma. The city was united and divided. 
Brown people everywhere were unjustly indicted. We declared a war on terrorism, falsely called it heroism, but there were no weapons of mass destruction. We were, hate, we were fed help, hateful propaganda as instruction. Today, I stand up against violence, I denounce terror. We can reflect in mourning and recognize national errors. We learned not to judge another country by its most violent actors. We learned the road to 9-11 had many imperialist chapters. I pray for the victims, survivors, and the soul of this country. I pay, pray for peace in these times because war is always ugly. I think so much about people who boarded planes, went to work, and who planned for a normal day until everything went berserk. Employees were scared but told to stay at their stations. They were told to be obedient and wait for more information. I remember the people who were running late, whose slow mornings drastically changed their fate. We still have time to transform the hate and truly make this country great. I remember being seven, crying, feeling the weight of the tragedy. I remember waking up the next day, hoping deeply that it was a fantasy. 9-11 is a day that New Yorkers can never forget. I was seven years old. My mind was filled with thoughts of death. 19 years later, we've never found the weapons of mass destruction. 19 years later, and we're fading through lies and dysfunction. The war on terror brought war to civilians. Now we've spent billions just to kill millions? Is that justice? Is that revenge? Do we feel better? Did we avenge? How do we heal? How can we grow from this ordeal? How can we learn from the pain and honor the people slain in vain? I have an idea. We must learn to look at the harmful message that led us to the start of this dark genesis. 19 years later, 9-11, 2001. And so I wanted to start with this piece um, because often we don't think about 9-11 as a climate disaster. We think about it as an act of terrorism. We don't think about the people who couldn't go home, the people who had to walk the bridges, the people who continue to suffer with lung cancer to this day. We don't often think about the climate disasters that are happening in our own neighborhoods. And I think it's really important to think about the ways that education played a role in some of this and how education can play a role in continuing to understand the role of war, the role of imperialism, of science, of ethics and power in shaping our world. Um, and so this was kind of one of the first things that I often think about when I think about what does it mean to have a more just climate? What does it mean? Is it just about our environment? Um, when we think about the trees, or is it also about the planes? Is it also about these boardrooms? Is it also about these political decisions and going to the ballot box and voting and protesting? It's about all of these things. And we must always remember not to silo them and not to look at them in a vacuum. We must always remember to think that all of these things are connected as we vote, as we move through the world. They're all connected to the air that we breathe, the people that are on the streets, the folks who are surviving with these traumas. And we must always remember to center them. The next piece that I'm going to read is an introduction, um, and it's about my Haitian heritage. Um, I think that one thing that Braden Kay said um, on the screen when he was talking about was about centering indigenous communities and really spending that time to think about what that means and why that's important and how like indigenous communities have been protectors of the realm before sustainability was possible and popular and before any of these spaces existed. It's always important to remember the Peeposh people when we're here, to remember the Akamel O'odham, to remember those folks when we're here because we are here on the land that they've been protecting and that they continue to protect despite imperialism, despite colonialism, despite genocide. Um, and the most important way that I learned this lesson was through being Haitian. Um, so in our native tongue, Haiti is IET. And when in 1804, when we freed ourselves from the French colonizers, we gave ourselves that name IET because it was the name that the Taino Arawak people who lived on our island gave the name. It means land of high mountains. Learning this was one of the ways that I learned that Black people, Haitian people, folks who have been fighting in the war against colonialism and imperialism have constantly tried to remember and put that legacy forward. 
And so this piece is a short one and it's called, We Kept Our Tiny No Name. IET means land of high mountains. So I'm reaching into divine allowance and connecting my spirit with the sun, undoing generations of trauma one by one. Haitians honor indigenous legacy with our name. We want the Taino roots to remain in our history, in our culture, in our nation. Our country doesn't want the empire's salvation. Future generations will need reminders of Haitian and Taino freedom fighters. Our rituals, our tradition, and our history are all part of our legendary trajectory. So I climb mountains to connect dates and dots. I climb until I feel closer to God. My path is ancestral and spiritual by design. I take steps through memory, through rhyme, through time. As I climb through the rugged earth to the peak, there's something special about this technique. Taking steps towards the sky to bring life to new vision, getting in touch with so many histories through intuition. We kept our Taino name. And so this last piece is just to remind us that education is everywhere. Education is in our history, it's in the mountains, it's in nature, it's in the sun. And the more that we recognize that we have more to learn from the earth than the earth needs to be saved by us, the more that we can tap into those lessons. And so thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for the rest of this evening to continue to speak with you all. And I'm so grateful for the work that's happening here. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Amazing as always, and so inspiring. I also wanted to give you a really quick overview of the program for the rest of the day. We have a really nice lunch that we are inviting everybody to join us in room 510, right after the closing of the ceremony. And right afterwards, after the lunch, we will have three panels, uh, the three events that we organized. One right after the lunch at 1.30 is a panel discussion with our partners, our local partners in the region. And uh, it will be a discussion about creating access to sustainability education right here. Our next panel will be at 245, and uh, it's a roundtable organized by our dear partners, UNESCO Bridges Coalition, and it's called What Are the Human Sciences? Uh, it will bring together faculty across the different units at ASU and our colleague from King's College London. And thank you, Joni Adamson, who is here for organizing that event. And we will close with a session which is called Policy Meets Art, where we will bring in dialogue education policymakers and youth activists uh, and artists about the climate futures in the region. So all three events should be very exciting, dynamic, and powerful. And we hope that you will join us to make more connections and to build more bridges as we begin reimagine and redefine the future of um, Arizona, the future of education and the future of our region. So thank you so much for joining today. Thank you for all of our amazing guests and uh, you are all welcome to join us at lunch. Thank you. <laughs>